are watching West Harper Community yeah. Television. You're watching West Harper Community Television. You're watching West Harper Community Television. For the community, by the community. Art Talks, the show where we talk about and talk to artists, talk about art and their creativity. I'm the host of the show, Joanne Bauer, and I welcome you here today. I'm thrilled to have three guests with me, but before I even introduce them, I want to right up front talk about or give you the logistics of an event that's coming up that used to be actually in West Hartford, but this time it's going to be in a Hartford location at the Unitarian Meeting House. This is the Hiroshima Nagasaki Remembrance, and you'll see later how it connects to one of our guests. That's going to happen on August 6th starting at 5.30 with a potluck, and the actual program begins at 7 p.m. with music, poetry, many guest speakers, and then at the end, at 8 p.m., there's a candlelight ceremony. So this is a memorial, a shared call for the abolition of nuclear weapons, promoting a vision of a nuclear-free world. My guest today, uh, uh, to my immediate left, is Pete Butkovich, who's here to talk about his father's art, and his father, Paul Martin Butkovich, was an anti-atomic weapon artist, along with many other things that he did. So we're going to chat about his father. Then next to him is Cheryl Hack, who's the executive director of Connecticut Landmarks, and she's going to tell us some things that are coming up in the summer at Butler McCook and some other locations and really whatever you want to talk about. Next to her is Tanisha Duggan, who's with Heartbeat Ensemble, and she will tell us about that wonderful organization and what they have coming up in Hartford for the summer. So welcome, everyone. Thank you. So Thank happy you, to have Thank you here. You. Pete, let's start with you. Okay. Your father. Tell us, about, tell us about his art and also about his life. I know that he's quite a, he was quite a visionary artist ahead of his time. I would be glad to, Joanne, but first of all, uh, thank you for this special invitation. It's a treat to be here, mm -hmm. a special honor to talk about uh, his, my dad and his artwork. Uh, this photograph was taken at the Corcoran School of Art, Washington, D.C. As a young teenager, uh, he was actually, uh, at a very young age, was passionately wanting to be an artist. Uh, he left the Midwest, went to uh, the Corcoran School on 17th Street in Washington, D.C., just a block or so from the White House. Uh, for personal and financial reasons, he left there, returned back home, and ended up helping the, uh, with the family business. But he never gave up on his dreams to be an artist and uh, kept, his, kept practicing and working at it. Uh, also early on, his, he strived to become an, a political cartoonist. Mm -hmm. uh, he was influenced by uh, a, a cartoonist from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch by the name of Daniel Fitzpatrick. Uh, Fitzpatrick was very important in bringing the country's awareness up about the pending World War II and the Nazis. Uh, so Dad followed his work very closely. Uh, as an artist and a struggling uh, political, partoon, political cartoonist, uh, he worried about, uh, the, at the height of the Cold War, how the United States uh, had used uh, atomic weapons and the proliferation of these weapons as Russia and the United States began rattling their nuclear sabers. Off to my right is the first editorial cartoon he had published in the Midwestern newspapers. Uh, this represented his effort to share with the world a, a nuclear war warning and his fear that we could blow up the whole world. This image was actually published in the Midwest newspapers in 1954, eight years before President Kennedy's Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, he, he took the iconic image of Christ on the cross combined with a nuclear bomb cloud in the background and took the quote, uh, from the Bible, Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. 
He was motivated because if you look at this image directly behind me, this is what our world looked like in the early 1950s. This is actually an atomic bomb test at Bikini Atoll, probably 1953, 1954 time frames. And you could see the size and magnitude of it. Now this was probably in the neighborhood of 15 kilotons. By the end of the height, at the height of the Cold War, Russia had tested a nuclear weapon that had 50 megatons, hundreds and hundreds of times more powerful than what was dropped on Japan. But as an artist, he struggled with how to communicate the horror of these weapons. So he ended up, uh, over decades, it evolved into different types of images. And in the front at, at this table here, you can see that it evolved from representational artwork uh, with the iconic images to more surrealistic artwork. And you can see that there's skeleton arms and hands. They're raised like in a victory, but there's no victory. And his metaphor was, that was taken as a metaphor from professional boxing. At the end of a fight, they'll raise the winner's hand. And what my father was trying to communicate is, if we get into a mass nuclear war, there'll be no winners. It could, in fact, be the end of mankind. So this was, these were very, very strong emotions that he had. Uh, he, was, he was one of, uh, one of eight boys. Uh, and when he passed and my mother passed, I was sort of tasked with the job of, what do I do with all this artwork? Tell us how many pieces. Uh, uh, there's probably about 60 pieces like this, uh, the, what I call uh, professionally matted and framed that are exhibit ready. Uh, but they're not all nuclear war pieces. As right. an artist, he did the traditional things of portraits and landscapes and so forth. Right. Uh, and and he was quite accomplished, I have to say. Thank you. You've shown me, I just want to interrupt to say that you've shown me some of his other artwork mm -hmm. of the thoroughbre thoroughbreds. He yeah. loved horses and the dynamism in the, in the imagery. And of course, he did figure studies. He started mm -hmm. with figure studies. Mm -hmm. So, but what we know him for in our West Hartford peace and justice community are these images that you've brought now. This will be the third year that, yes. that you're bringing mm -hmm. them to the Hiroshima Nagasaki Remembrance event. That is and correct. And that's how you and I first met. Yeah. They, are, they are very powerful images. How many images do you think you'll be bringing with you this time to the Unitarian meeting house? Uh, the, at the Unitarian, I've actually had a prior in 2006, I had a full-blown exhibit at the Rotunda at the oh, Unitarian right. Meeting right. House, where not only the anti-nuclear war images, but also had his thoroughbred racing images. Of the, the most powerful work is his anti-nuclear war work. His most popular work is his thoroughbred racing images. They are really fantastic pieces of work. And if you don't realize how difficult it is, try drawing a racehorse in movement uh, on a from piece of memory. paper. And from memory. He's doing this yeah. from memory. Yes. That is correct. Do you know, he's not working in plein air. He's not no. working with these yeah. uh, from, from a photograph. Yeah. He's not working from horse studies. He's doing it from memory. Yeah. It's many very of, impressive. Many of the images are, uh, uh, his portraits are very powerful. Uh, I think he, uh, unlike Picasso, I think uh, deconstructed women, I think my father loved women, and his portraits of women are just absolutely beautiful pieces of work. Some are uh, relatives and neighbors that, that I knew growing up. Really? Yeah, and uh, some of them are just from his imagination, the way he would do their hair and some clothes. It was just fantastic. But he always stayed with figure studies. Many artists today uh, have, have moved away from doing figure studies in the human form. And my father often said, if you can't do the human form, you're not really an artist. That's, and, and you and I had that conversation, yeah. you know, of just yeah. important, how, how important I think figure studies are. Also, that's sort of where I started. Uh -huh. And you can see the same impact in, in the horses, in the, in the structure and the musculature of, of, of your father's work. Mm -hmm. So, Pete, I'm wondering, what stands out for you about the Hiroshima Nagasaki event that's in Hartford, West Hartford? I think we tend to forget about the dangers uh, uh, offered by these weapons. Uh, the, the world is still a very dangerous place. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think at the height of uh, the Homeland Security folks, the thing that's most foremost in their mind is that one of these destructive weapons could be used again. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that's a concern of mine. I'm glad to see that each year we remember how horrible the weapons are, the kind of destruction they can cause. Uh, they're the ultimate weapons, and we've learned how to have, have ultimate death from these weapons. What would your 
I'm imagining what, what would your father have felt um, about uh, us having to continue to memorialize this, the, this event of, of the events of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, given that it's so many more years now, even past his death. He died in 96, is correct? Correct, 1996. Right. What do you think he might have felt? Well, in 2015, it'll be 70 years since we used these weapons. Uh -huh. right. And in 70 years and all that time, there's still hundreds of them out there. Where they're, they're still a tremendous danger. I think he would have felt like, why, why is it this many years going by and we haven't eliminated these horrible weapons? Do you think, as, as an artist, that he would have sensed any frustration? Because I know that he felt art is, is political in some sense. How, yeah. what, do you, what do you think he might have uh, I had referenced earlier uh, Daniel Fitzpatrick from The Post. Uh, Fitzpatrick was the f one of the first editorial cartoonists to really bring home the, the, the danger of the war in Germany. And my father felt just as strongly from following his work that by him using these warning messages in his art that he could help people in our generation. Right. So he, he, your dad had a mission. Yes, he did. <laughs> Definitely had a mission. Yeah. Yes, he did. We, yeah, I know you have a sentence that you oh, want to read yeah. that we might read now. Why don't, okay. if you can I'd find it quickly be, or we'll re read it I would it be at glad to. Uh, he had some, uh, he was designated or nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in 1955. Uh -huh. And a, a portfolio of his images was uh, submitted to Columbia University. And with it was a handwritten letter. It's the only handwritten letter of his that the family still has. And I thought I would close my remarks by reading his last sentence. To enter into a competition of this kind has concerned me, has given me great concern. My only wish is that my entry is accepted and judged. And my only wish today is that the, your viewers uh, enjoy the work, uh, understand a little bit more about him, and that he'll gain some recognition from this. And they can certainly come see more of the images on yes. August 6th. Yep. Thank you, Pete, You're very so welcome. much. Cheryl Hack, please welcome. And now we're going to switch to something a little bit lighter in, in tone. And yeah. you're executive director of the Connecticut Landmarks Organization, and you've been busy with lots of activities. What would you like to tell us about yeah, first? Yeah, we absolutely have, Joanne. So, you know, we're so excited because we opened the newly renovated uh, historic Amos Bull House, the oldest brick building in Hartford and the first building in Connecticut to be placed on the National Register oh. of Historic Places. Yes, so in June. Uh, and attached to the Amos Bull House is the 1865 Butler McCook Carriage House. Uh, the Butler McCook family redid their property. Um, this is the Butler McCook House on uh, Main Street, 396 Main Street for, for your viewers. Uh, and uh, the carriage house was, was built uh, as part of a whole landscape redesign that the family undertook um, in partnership with Jacob Wiedemann, who is a noted a landscape architect, took a lot of the Olmsted commissions that Olmsted couldn't do, designed uh, Bushnell Park and Cedar Hill Cemetery. Mm -hmm. So we've really built on Olmsted's work um, by adding some additional garden features. We've built an addition which houses public access uh, elevator and stair uh, to get to our new meeting and community education center. We have a new archival research center as well and a kitchen to support uh, function use in the garden. So we uh, so the I have a lot to Bull celebrate. House. Yes, you do. And, and I was able to tour it in June, yes. and it's very impressive. So the yes. Amos Bull House, one would access from Prospect Street 59 primarily. South Prospect, yes. yes. We have a little okay. parking court now. And that is the new uh, administrative headquarters for our organization. And certainly when we talk about art, art talks, uh, yes. we, we include architecture yes. and historic yes. architecture and Hartford certainly has had its share of wonderful architecture and, and we're glad that some of it remains. Yes, <laughs> yes, well of course, and, and we of course have art to talk about too. Yes, so um, we've had the pleasure of uh, exhibiting and selling the work of local artists for eight years now, I think, it's at been the eight property. Years? It has at Butler oh, McCook, yeah. So, and, and now we have additional exhibition space in the Amos Bull House and uh, Community Education Center. So I know that we're, we're opening your exhibition on That's July That's true. 10th. So we're <laughs> thrilled. That will be part of our monthly cultural cocktail hour, second Thursday second of the month. Thursday. And so in addition to your beautiful work, we will have uh, food and wine and music in the garden and of course an opportunity to see the new spaces I've just described. 
Right, and correct me if I'm mistaken, but it seems that there's quite a bit of entertainment that night planned with CT Improv and the gospel group Lift Every Voice and Sing. Yes, which is very exciting. It is. Yes, and then of course uh, we will have our Garden Sounds concert series in August, so that's something for your viewers as well. All the information about our programs and properties is at www.ctlandmarks.org. It's very important to get that right out in front to it get is, the website. Right? And the gardens are spectacular. I happen yes. to have been there um, yesterday. Of course, when this airs, it will slightly uh, be a different time, time frame, but the Hartford Blooms and Plein Air Painters have been yes. at Butler McCook. Yes. And well, how just fascinating. It's it's just wonderful. And, I, and it's interesting to me that you call it cultural cocktail hour because I've thought about how many cultures you're you're highlighting in yes. that program on second Thursdays. There will be the visual art, me, <laughs> and the and the entertainment and the gardens and then Will there be a chance to tour again the Amos Bull House? Yes, we'll have the Amos Bull House open um, for people to see, and we will be uh, displaying at some point in July the work of the plein air artists in the Bull House oh, and Carrot House. We have, we have a lot right. of um, hanging space now, as mm -hmm. you saw. It's you quite impressive. Do. Yeah, we really do. We, we uh, have had Sandy Welch's work up since the opening, which is a huge privilege. Right, and Sandy works big, so yeah. she's got yeah. big pieces on the wall, but right. uh, you can handle, right. as you said, lots of art. And so the plein air Hartford Bloom's artist will be there. How long will be will they be there? At some Cheryl? point in July. I mean, I think we're we're looking to hang uh, shows quarterly at this in the Bull oh, House nice. and Carriage House because um, it, it really is um, amazing to see it there, and it seems like it's yeah. it's nice to to leave it up for a little while. Right. I'm sure it enhances your office space and your your workspace, but. At the same time, it means someone has to hang all of those pieces. So I just want to point out what a commitment all of you make to your communities, really, because there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that that folks don't necessarily think about. And I know when I was down to see yeah. the Amos Bull House and just imagining hanging all of those pieces, it's a big deal. It, it is. really is a big it deal. Is. So, so I'd love to talk about gardens too, just in general, yes. because um, it is a gorgeous time to be out and about in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And in addition to the Butler McCook Garden in Hartford, we have a gorgeous garden at our Bellamy Faraday House and Garden in Bethlehem. So that's just down from Litchfield, lovely, you know, daycation drive out there, um, as well as a gorgeous garden at our Phelps Hathaway House on the Main Street in Suffield. So right. there are just two of our other properties, but so, so much to do and see in Connecticut at this time Absolutely. of year. Absolutely, and of course, gardening is a, an art form all of all of its own, and it's yes. what people are thinking about now. And definitely, come the people definitely come out to the garden tours and to the gardens that you have to get inspired. Really, they yes. take ideas home yes. and then start reworking their patios. Yes. It's yes. so cool. And we do offer garden workshops and watercolor botanical workshops at oh, our do? property in Bethlehem. Yes. I yes. I know that. That's that's great. So again, and let's have you repeat your your yeah. um your website. So yes, so www.ctlandmarks.org. Great. Great. And so I'm going to then turn to Tanisha Duggan at this point and certainly anyone feel free to question or uh, you make, make, make remarks across, we can allow a crosstalk here. <laughs> Tanisha Duggan is with another Hartford-based arts group, and that's Heartbeat Ensemble, mm -hmm. which has been in Hartford for 12 years now. And we're so glad that you could join today to tell us what's coming up and tell us a little bit about the history of Heartbeat and where you're located, and that speaking of historic architecture, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Lots of connections. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. I mean, we just moved in. I can't say just because we're a little over a year in our new home. Uh, we are a 12-year-old organization, and for 11 of those years, we were really street performers. So you could find us anywhere. We'd be at the Charter Oak Cultural Center. Uh, most recently, for our production of Flipside, we were at the Hollander, uh, and then about a year ago, we moved to uh, Asylum Hill 
where we're across the street from Mark Twain in our own little uh, location, uh, 360 Farmington Avenue. 360 Farmington Avenue. And I want to point out to people that they can park at the Mark Twain mm -hmm. house parking lot because that's kind of important. You don't have Absolutely. parking right exactly, right, public right. parking right at right. your carriage house. We are definitely a, a neighborhood sort of institution, and so we do use the Twain house's parking uh, lot for our visitors uh, to make it accessible. Um, because and it's a collaboration, which Absolutely. is so important when it comes to parking it's, in Hartford. <laughs> uh, oh my goodness, to say the least. And we are about collaboration. I mean, we are looking to work with the McCook House this summer for our oh. Festival of Food, and, uh, uh, Food Justice, which is exciting that you're here because we've just started sort of talking about that partnership. Like you Excellent. said, with the Mark Twain House, we're working with them. Um, they're bringing Amy Goodman in July, and so we're partnering with them to bring Amy Goodman um, to their space and to sort of engage in civic dialogue, uh, and then we'll Excellent. be back with them again in October with Noam Chomsky. So we're all about sort of community partners and, and working with other organizations to speak about art um, and to talk about issues that affect our community. So if, if, one, if a person wanted to know the exact, I don't know if you have the date for Amy Goodman mm -hmm. with you today in your mind, if I, not, but the, yeah. you have the website. Let's Absolutely. say your website too. You can visit us at heartbeatensemble.org, and that's H-A-R-T. B E A T ensemble.org, and you'll have all of our events there uh, listed throughout the summer. Our partner events, we're also doing something actually at the top of July with the uh, Hartford Public Library to uh, commemorate the anniversary of the circus fire. So we've oh, been commissioned to write a piece. Um, really, they have a, a large collection of stories that they've collected from survivors and, and survivors' families. And so we've taken those stories because what we're known for is taking first-hand accounts and interviews from people and turning them into theater. And so they've asked us to, to look at those, um, those articles uh, and put them together mm -hmm. into a piece to honor the memory of, of, of that fire. And that's at the Hartford Library. Yes. With, I know they have a Hartford collection within mm -hmm. the, the main branch, oh, I shouldn't say the main, the main library right. there on Main Street, mm -hmm. which is just down from yeah, where, exactly. where you're located <laughs> at Butler McCook. So, um, Tanisha, you started, you, I mean, you did say, and, and I think we should say a little bit more about how Heartbeat is inspired and how they create their Absolutely. pieces. Um, we were founded by three best friends uh, when they were working in San Francisco at the San Francisco Mind Troupe. Uh, one of our co-artistic directors, Julia Rosenblatt, she's actually from Hartford. Um, her parents are now in West Hartford and her sister is in West Hartford as well. All right. um, and so she sort of concocted this plan with them and said, guys, there's plenty of civic theater happening here in San Francisco, but my little hometown, is not quite <laughs> little, uh, definitely is in need of a theater like this. So they came here in 2001 and started from the bottom and created this theater company that really was about telling stories of our community. So that is our mission, is to tell the stories of underheard voices, whether it be based on gender or race or geography or class, um, but we're really looking at voices that are not mainstream. Um, and how do we tell those stories and how does that affect the fabric of all of our lives? Right. Um, and, and can you talk a little bit about the process? Mm -hmm. Because actually they go out and interview community people, right? Absolutely. Our, our, um, our main, most of our main stage productions are created through interview process. So we will go out into the community, um, it's depending on what the topic is. Uh, most recently, and the piece that we're working on now is called Gross Domestic Product, which Julia is, is writing. And that's about motherhood and what it would look like if it were a line item in our economy. So Julia wow. went out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Julia went out and she's... Uh, in the process of, of cultivating about 100 interviews with different moms um, and other organizations that really look to caretaking in general. So not just motherhood, but if you are taking care of an elderly parent, if you're taking care of a, a family member who is disabled, and what that life is like. So we'll go out, we'll gather those interviews, we'll find similarities, commonalities, and then we'll sort of put together a story based on all of those of all of those findings oh my goodness it's like you're doing a dissertation every <laughs> couple of weeks it's definitely i mean it's definitely a part of what we do the interview and research because she's worked with um a lot of organizations uh selma james who in 19 in the 1950s really sort of 
coined the term wageless workers. And she has an organization, an international organization, mm -hmm. that looks at this kind of work. So it's a combination of these interviews with real life people and research. And we've extended this process to our Youth Play Institute. So they come in in the summer times and we teach them how we write plays. And we give them a topic this uh, summer. They're looking at food justice, which is a part of our sort of summer long food look at food justice and they're going to be going out into the community to talk to people who struggle um, with food security and they will be doing research and reading you know articles and 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 looking at the research and and finding finding what they can to make a story that's I relevant. I never realized just how much back backdrop work is involved because when you're talking about a hundred mm -hmm. a hundred interviews mm -hmm. that then you have to cull and find mm -hmm. themes with and then turn into art <laughs> oh my goodness that seems incredible for any of you are there volunteer opportunities that you want to highlight for our audience or any, any needs that you have for the audience to know about? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. For us, um, we're a small organization, so volunteers are definitely a part of our backbone. We're always looking for volunteers. Uh, you can find out that information at our website as well. Um, we use volunteers as ushers, as most theaters do, but we also have volunteers for various office things. So if there's someone who's really, you know, into graphic design and wants to sort of flex that muscle, we're always open and available for that stuff too. We believe in supporting our community in any way we can and volunteerism is one of the best ways to do it. And you mentioned your youth institute. Is it too late for someone to get involved for the summer if they wanted for to? For the summer it is, but that's a year, uh, it's a, an ongoing uh, program. Our next one comes in the fall. It's an internship program, a paid internship program. Oh, okay. So the kids can take either the, you know, the fall, winter semester, or the spring semester, or come in the, in the summer, and that stuff can be found on our website as well. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, is there any, anything else that any of you, that's occurred to any of you to uh, want to say about your organizations that we haven't covered? I'm like, I always have to make the plug because we, we're starting to do art in our space because like you, I was thinking, oh my goodness, yeah, we have all of this hanging space. Our home is built in 1899 and so Beautiful. we've started to use the full space to exhibit art because there's nothing like, I mean, when you've got bare walls, you might as well fill it with artists, right? That's Absolutely. exciting. Yeah. And, and we could just say quickly, because we are just about finished, but you did an unveiling, your friend's wall, mm -hmm. recently, and that was an, a local, a local, a local artist, artist. Victor Pacheco, yes, we commissioned him to do um, a piece for us uh, to sort of celebrate our friends. We call them the friends, those who support us um, in our work. Mm -hmm. And so we, we called on Victor, and he created this beautiful piece for us that's based on our logo. And we want to continue those kinds of relationships because, you know, as we talked about, art is, and, and you're doing this with your, you know, creative, your cultural cocktails, right? Mm -hmm. Art is sort of, in, engages all different kinds of, of work and Absolutely. we want to support it's that the fabric of our lives mm. <laughs> I, would, I would just add an encouragement for your viewers to yes. come out and support and participate in Hiroshima Day yes. and the remembrance of Hiroshima yes and for those viewers that like to see more images of my dad's work right Tap they can the they can look page. on Facebook under artist Paul Martin Butkovich, I think they'll enjoy it. Good, thank you. Again, that's August 6th. Correct. And also, Joanne, um, speaking of the art of food, <laughs> we have an amazing uh, dinner at the Nathan Hale Homestead with a West Hartford connection. So we're delighted to be working uh, for our third year now oh, with yeah. Scott Miller from, yeah. yes, for the Max Oyster Bar oh, Chef nice. uh, for our annual dinner at the homestead at the Nathan Hale Homestead. That will be a multi-course local food extravaganza oh, on nice. the Saturday after Labor Day. So Saturday, Excellent. September 6th, uh, starting with an open homestead event and an opportunity to hear cultural music and enjoy uh, seasonal cocktails and see the homestead and then have this amazing, amazing dinner. So we all need to be yeah, there. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It was delightful to see you. And again, this is Art Talks on West Hartford Community Television, and I thank the station.